This Choircast podcast is brought to you in part by the Liminal Living Podcast. Liminal, the word a thousand miles wide but small enough to fit into the present moment. It describes an in-between place. We live most of our lives within this space, not quite ever arriving at our idealistic final destination. We spend so much of our energies on our best impersonation of who we wish we were, until we can't. But in sneaks a dark night of the soul, or perhaps a mystical experience. Our way of being has an error loop introduced. Today we call that deconstruction. Welcome to the Liminal Living Podcast, where we teach you how to be here, how to traverse these spaces, and where we can go if we remain humble, open, and honest. Ni hao, and welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. Brian, how are you, my old friend? I am very good, and I'm and I'm old, so I'm okay with that. How many times do you think you have said ni hao, given you lived in China for so long? Oh, I've said it a lot, a lot, a lot, but I don't think I've ever said it on the pod- podcast before, and I said it like an Aussie. I went ni hao. I didn't go ni hao, which is how I should have said it. You did. It, it was beautiful. I've been well. I've been well. It's um, it's always busy. My the front end of the year for me is nuts, and I know we talk about busyness quite often, but it's just been one of those things. Lots of lots of critical things happening at work at the moment, which in the field I work in means that there can be harm to people. So if there's a lot of of harm and threats of harm at the moment, which it just seems like silly season. But then I saw that it is coming up to a full moon so you never know I, I know that when i've worked in mental health spaces there is a connection with full moon and nuttiness so there is something in that i think did did you want me to pray for you brian if you're going through a hard time put you on a prayer <laughs> chain yeah that'd be great that would be fantastic if you could um all right did, did you I, want to do it now or maybe later no no let's save it for later um because okay, i okay. i don't want to manifest live on air Okay, cool. I'll just speak in tongues quietly under my breath. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is beautiful. Hey, do you remember Cape Fear? I think it had De Niro in it, that movie, but at the end of it, he went down into the water speaking in tongues. And I remember I was in the fundamentalist scene then going, oh, what's happened? Satan's in control of Hollywood again. So, yeah, I remember yeah. I remember you told me about that when it happened, when you actually yeah. saw that movie. I'm, I've never seen it, but yeah. That was something that I remember really troubled you. It did trouble me. Now I look at it and go, well done. So Troy, let's get into it. We are, we are going to get into it. We've got a, a, a great guest today who we've just been having a natter to before we, we kick off. And today is is going to be a really interesting conversation, particularly for us ex-fundies. And uh, because today we're going to be talking about a subject near and dear, and one that affects everybody eventually, and that is death. We're speaking today to Zenith Virago. Zenith's a highly respected celebrant, educator, public speaker, and author, and she is very fortunate to live in Byron Bay in Australia, and I'm sure that our US listeners have heard of Byron Bay. Everyone's heard of Byron Bay. It's a beautiful part of Australia. Um, Although, Zenith, you will will hear a little bit of an accent because she's from the UK. She's the founder of the Natural Death Care Centre, and that's a charity, and was also named Byron Bay Citizen of the Year in 2021 for recognition of her work that we are going to speak to today. Zenith, that work is you are a celebrated death walker, and you've been doing that for more than 30 years. I want to welcome you to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to be here with you. And everyone who's listening. Oh, there's lots of people listening and there's lots of people that are going to certainly um, take a lot of uh, lot of the information you say today and certainly process it and hopefully through the lens of their post-fundamentalist lives. And, and Zenith, I hope you don't take offence at this, but I this is sort of brewing in me that the term death walker sounds like something from Game of Thrones or Star Wars. So I really want to hear what is a death walker. So for me, I'm walking towards my own death, 
so I'm in my 60s now. I've worked with death for you know over 30 years. And for many years, I didn't have a title. I just, people said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I work with people who are dying or their families. And that worked fine for me because no one was really interested. And then they would either start a conversation or walk away and be shocked. But about 15 years ago, I decided I needed to have a title because what was coming into vogue was the term death doula, which I don't like because someone told me very early that the word doula meant female slave from other periods of time when you know armies would one country would you know invade another steal kill everybody steal all the women and put them into slavery and so I was just like that's not going to work for me and I thought well, what am I actually doing and I thought well I'm accompanying people in their death journey and their families and really I'm willing to walk alongside them because it's their journey I'm just coming with my experience and my information and whatever anything else that I have to offer them. And so I took the word death walker, but I did Google it and it, it is in some zombie apocalypse film or something, but I figure, you know, it's about reclaiming everything. So, and I've always been a woman who's lived on their own terms. So I was just like, oh, that's edgy. I like it, but I don't want to be a death doula. That's just not going to work for me. It would be a really good sci-fi name, though, Zenith Deathwalker. I mean, that's just absolutely brilliant. Well, it's a great life name. You know, Zenith, as you probably know, or Zenith for Americans, uh, means the highest point. I changed my name when I came to live in Byron when I was 27. It was very the thing to do then in the 80s. And... Um, I thought I just want to become the person that I want to be. I don't need to be tied to another country. I don't need to be tied to another family. I'm just going to, and I took, so I took Zenith, which means the highest point, and Virago, which is a feminist archetype. And I have to say, after 40 years with that name, uh, I've really become someone I could not have possibly imagined. And if I wanted to take a name that people would remember, I couldn't have done a better job. But really, I was just a hippie having fun, you know, poking fun at at the establishment, you know, because people say, I'd love to change my name. And I'm like, well, fucking change it then, you know, don't live with something that's not working for you. We're autonomous beings, you know, you don't need to be attached to your family. But And women have to change their name all the time when they get married because that's a cultural expectation for them. But to do it just for yourself, it's been lots of fun, I have to say. So Zenith Virago Deathwalker is just like, yeah, rock on. I, I love it. When I did um, find you online, I started reading and the more I read about you, I'm like, you are Zenith Virago. Like all this, the daring things that it is, but you've said has been said about you. I thought it's such an awesome name. So well done on that renaming. It, you had a lot of foresight and it's definitely worked for you and, and is working for you. It is, but then is it the chicken or the egg though? Do you change it because you know something is coming and you need to be in that? Or does it come to you because you change it? And I have spent my whole life... And I'm unable to draw a conclusion on the chicken and the egg dilemma of anything to do with our lives. I think you changed your name and it came to you. That That's my theory. You look at a lot of pop stars who have got very bland names, John Smith or something like that, and they change it to something like Engelbert Humperdinck, and people don't forget them. I don't think he changed his name to Engelbert Humperdinck, but one that you're thinking of, Brian, I think is Gordon Sumner, who changed his name to Sting. And he he is Sting, isn't he? He's not Gordon Sumner at all. He is he is not Gordon Sumner. Um, I'm look. I'll Google it later, but I'm pretty sure that Engelbert Humperdinck did change his name. I'm I'm pretty certain because I remember thinking when I heard something about it, why the fuck would you change your name to that? But everyone remembers his name, don't they? Well, it was a composer. 
Ah, here you go. Ah, so he wanted to sound like a composer. It was a composer from a past century. Ah. I grew up with Engelbert Humperdinck, and I think his name was, I want to say Jerry Dorsey or something, something very bland and ordinary, but it worked for him. It did. Okay, so our first question, although we've already sort of thrown one your way, but our first real question that we wanted to ask you was, were you a teenage fundamentalist? Um, not in that sense. So I was fortunate enough to grow up in England with very ordinary working class parents. Uh, and I didn't grow up with any religion. And I, so I was allowed to, and I had a great childhood, which wasn't particularly privileged, but was free. And I wasn't damaged in any way, apart from, you know, everyone who's fucked up somewhere in our internal lives but externally and it coming at me I wasn't damaged right by religion uh, by violence or emotional manipulation anything like that I had a very ordinary time and within that I became at about seven I realized the world was unfair on gender and so I at seven I became a feminist in one moment and as a teenager, I probably was a fundamentalist feminist, and that would be the only box I could tick on that. But I'm very happy about that. I'm less stroppy now, but I've spent most of my life absolutely forging a path as a woman in a feminist perspective, and that's been lots of fun. You said there was a moment when you were seven. That, that sort of triggered that? Well, was there a particular moment or a theme in your life happening? Yeah, no, there was a particular moment where, as I say, I went to school. It was a pretty groovy sort of school. Uh, everybody could, the headmistress was very open. And so I was playing football and cricket and all those seasonal sports with the boys because I was a very sporty girl. And then suddenly this, at seven, there was a pick for the school soccer team. And when I looked at the piece of paper on the notice board, I wasn't in that team. And I looked up at the teacher who was the only male teacher in that whole school. And I said, how come I'm not in the team? And he looked at me as if to say, oh, poor thing, she doesn't get the game. Um, he said, because you're a girl. And I looked at him and I I was just in utter disbelief that the world would be that stupid that it didn't pick people on merit, it picked them on gender. And I, I was just like, so in my seven-year-old mind, I just was, you know what? I'm never going to lose because I'm a girl. I don't need to win. But if that's how the world works, I am never going to lose. And then he said to me, oh, but you can come and cut the oranges. So I don't know when you were young, that's what happened. So, and I looked at him and I was like, okay, I'll come and cut the oranges because you've got the afternoon off of lessons. But then I was coaching the boys that had to make up the numbers in because some of them were arty. They weren't sporty, but they, they had to have 11 boys to play in a team. And I was, so I became the sort of coach at seven and but it taught me a lot it that one incident and I've really never looked back and I've never changed that position and it's been a great fuel for me in my entire life to take on the system and conditioning and cultural expectations of people so I'm grateful for it now I wasn't grateful at seven I um I love that story, but I also love the stupidity of that teacher of giving access to a knife to cut up oranges to somebody who he's just told can't be on the football <laughs> team. So I mean, I'm sure with yeah, that sort yeah. of wisdom, he didn't last long. He was odd. He was a little bit odd, I must say. You know, it, was, it was of the day as well, wasn't it? I mean, we've certainly come a long way and uh, thank God we have come a long way. We, we've, touched on, yeah, that's right. we've touched on Death Walker. A very high level, but can you walk us through what would a what would a day in the life of Zenith Farago Deathwalker look like? From a work perspective, you mean? 
Yeah, I think so. Like, what are some of those things that you're asked to do? So often it involves, you know, I'll be sitting at my desk or doing whatever. And so I work for myself. I have a small charity because for me it was important 30 years ago before the internet that people could, before you could Google someone and find out about them, I just wanted people to come to me with an implicit trust that they didn't have to try and work out what I had to offer or who I was or whether I was trustworthy or not. I knew I was worthy of their trust. And so I thought I'm going to not create this work as a business. I'm going to do it as a not-for-profit, which has that implicit integrity, you would hope, unlike religion. And so I did that and people would ring just stop me in the street or people would ring and say hi I'm dying uh you know I'd like to talk to you about that and I would say okay is it urgent or have you got a bit of time and they'd say oh no it's fine I'm not planning on going anywhere soon so they were just plant they had a diagnosis they were doing treatment or not and they would be making a forward plan they were taking charge of that situation And others would say, actually, yeah, it's pretty urgent. You'll need to come this week. And so I would rearrange my things and I would go as soon as possible. And then when I got there, I would just meet everyone. Sometimes a person would be in bed. Sometimes they would be at the kitchen table. And my opening question usually was, what do you want from me? Because it was a role... I was just the person that was gathering the death knowledge in our community. So I had a legal job. I was then coordinator at the community centre in Byron Bay. I had a day job. But somehow or other, death had offered itself to me when my friend Sylvia died. And I'd said yes. And then it sort of had a life of its own. So people who are listening, you know, you may have had that experience where the mystery, the universe, what some people would call God, I don't know. Um, It makes an opening for you and you can either walk through it and catch the wave or you can go, no, I don't want to do that. That's too tough for me or I'm frightened or whatever. So death opened a a path for me and I was like, oh, yeah, that would be exciting. It was like an extreme sport because it was so real and when you're dealing with life and death you're in the profound and everything else becomes very mundane and it's sort of addictive it can be like a drug so a lot of because you're really in the meaning of life when you're sitting with someone who's dying and you're you're faced with assisting them in whatever way you can but I'm not a medical person so I don't ask people what they're dying from because I have nothing to contribute to that So I'm only responding to who's in front of me and what they want from me. And then we have a dialogue, but I don't come with any dogma. I just come with um, offering whatever I have. And the, the role that I'm taking in this area and now on a more international level is really an old traditional role that was always someone in a village or a tribe or in a community would hold the birth knowledge and be able to birth those babies alive and the mother alive at the end of that experience. And someone like me who held the death knowledge about what, how people might die, what to be expected, what they might need to do with all those questions that were coming up for them and to accompany them through that experience into the moment of death, the care for the body afterwards, and then the disposal and ceremony around that body. And for the people who were living on after that death, then walking with them as a continuum so that they had the healthiest bereavement they could have, rather than being devastated and, you know, disabled by that. They could be empowered by that experience by doing everything at every possible opportunity to be in charge of that for themselves, not not so much of the dying person, 
but everybody could do it on their own terms with some understanding. So in fact, it became a beneficial experience for everyone rather than a detrimental experience. Do you find that um, the response often becomes ritualistic or is it something that's a lot more individualised depending on what people's journeys are? If you follow a traditional faith and that faith is working for you or not, but you're invested in it, then you will follow the, the path with that member of clergy, with that religious leader, and you will follow the dogma of that organisation and do it in a way. So I don't generally see those people because they're going to their spiritual leader, their religious leader, while they're dying, and then in death they get caught up with that organisation. So what I, the people I see are sometimes people who have walked away. They may be Jewish, Catholic, not so much Muslim, uh, Indigenous, people that have just turned their back on a religion or a culture or a community that didn't work for them. And they want, they've lived their lives on in that place. And so when they die, they don't want to get swept back up into a mainstream or cultural approach. They want it to be meaningful and appropriate for them. So that might be what happens to their body. And it might be about the ceremony that is created to honour that person, to acknowledge that death. And of course, the, you know, mainly deaths break down into sudden or expected. And they're two very, very different circumstances to deal with, with people at the kitchen table and then to offer a ceremony for those people that doesn't include God but honours everybody's faiths and beliefs. But it gives you free range to create something that is meaningful and helpful and healing rather than a recruitment drive for God, whatever that might be for that religion. So it's much more flexible, but it's also much more helpful. Zenith, what's universally true, though? You've got all these people coming from different places and not sure, I'm sure some of them are not sure of what they want and what they think and what they believe. But in your experience, what, what are those universal experiences or universal things that you think, okay, I have to guide them through this and this and this and that? Or, or is that naive? Is it just totally different? Is it a snowflake for every different person you work with? I think it, it's an equation. So for every death, there's an equation. So it's who the person is, how they've lived and how they've died, plus who you are, your relationship to them and your familiarity with death will give you a response and that response will be very different each time. So if it's, let's say, a young niece or nephew and they've died suddenly in an accident because someone was neglectful, then your response to that is going to be shock, it's going to be horror, it's going to be, oh, my God, you know, they're, they're only a child and they're dead, you know, whatever. Whereas if it's someone who's 90 who's lived a long, fabulous life, who's looking at death as their next adventure, who's made it okay for all their family, their children and their grandchildren that they're leaving behind. They're sitting in the bed drinking gin and tonic and then they go, oh, I think this is it. Put the gin and tonic down, lay down and die. Now, there's not much in that to cause you a smash. It's more, you know, because you've had time to come to what you you would see it, people see it in what they call a natural order. I don't think there is a natural order, but people see it from that perspective. So in that, their ability to accept that death is easier. And so I'm trying to deal with everyone and even within each family, that it doesn't matter whether that death is sudden or expected, everybody is having their own response to that for whatever reason. And sometimes, as we know, there are secrets and uh, other things hidden within a family that sometimes death will bring to the surface because it frees something up to be expressed. So 
I'm dealing with everyone, even within each death, individually, that I have to. But to your question of universality, I think the simple thing is that whatever you believe, the body dies. So the physical body dies. So because some people think, oh, there is no death. And I just, I try and be with everyone, if whatever they believe, unless it's ludicrous. But, you know, a lot of people have beliefs that support them and I work with everyone. But the, the body will die. That's absolutely for a universal thing. And the thing I've probably found the most well-held belief is that something leaves the body. So occasionally you get people who don't believe that. They believe the body is organic and when it dies, that's it. Nothing lives on, Nothing. no energy leaves the body. So then, but probably I ask that question to large groups of people all the time and I would say 99% of people believe something leaves the body and they don't have to define that but they take comfort in that belief that that essence that energy that spirit soul whatever people want to label it leaves the body at the point of death and goes somewhere else does something else becomes something else I don't busy myself with that because you know Greater minds of mine have put their minds to that over many years and no one has come up with an absolute. And there are some other things around death uh, which science is now beginning to prove that people have believed for a very long time. So I just stay open to anything that people believe. I don't need to merge with it. I don't need to believe it, but I honour it. So I honour it when I'm sitting with them and I honour that in the ceremony that people hold a range of different faiths and beliefs and whatever they are, I trust they will support you at this time. And that that's and then I proceed because that's respectful to everyone. It, it's really interesting. Um, I've sat with several people as they've died and watched them watch them pass. And uh, I don't entirely know how to describe it, but except to say it's an absence. Something that was there a few seconds ago is no longer there. And it's, it's something that I've sat with. I'd, as I was leaving Christianity, my father died. Um, and then more recently, uh, others that I've sat with who have died it's exactly the same. So it wasn't pegged to my spiritual belief of Christianity. It was the very real experience that I was there and there was an absence. It's it's a, a strange thing that I don't think you can actually describe unless you experience it. Yeah, and where we are, because we're doing lots of ceremonies with open coffins in in the park outside and our children have been attending those ceremonies and sometimes the person in the coffin is a small child and that's open and the other kids are coming but what's amazing is that kids will come like this and they'll look over the edge of the coffin and you know there'll be adults gathered around the kids will be there there'll be a couple of them sometimes and this I'm saying this because this actually happened when I was standing there these two kids came and looked in the coffin and they said something like oh, that's not Brian, he's not there. And children see it very clearly because they don't have that sense of attachment or emotional uh, maturity that adults have. So they're not um, attached to the person in the same way. They're just having a new experience and no one's making a fuss and trying to be overprotective to them. And as they said that, looking in the coffin and had this little conversation, you could see the effect of that on all the adults. And they were just sort of, they were listening to the children and the kids were great teachers in that. But kids see it really simply, that that body is empty, that it is not the person, exactly what you're saying. So it, it's the absence of the life force 
or whatever label you want to put on it. It's 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 empty. What what do people need in the lead up? And I, I come back to this universality idea that again you talked about this equation that there must be certain things that some people need that all people need that you look at when you walk into the situation and you say what's in place here what needs to be in place here well it depends because you can't assume anything and so it's a it's a co-creation so for many years there was a phrase of which some people still use about holding space so when I first started that work, people would say to me all the time, oh, you're giving people permission to die. And my response would be, who am I to give anybody? But they're already dying. I, I don't have permission for them. They don't need my permission. They're just inviting me to share that moment. And the other concept was about holding space, which I don't know what that is for people, but f you're just willing to be there and to, to offer whatever you've got into that situation. Whereas now what I understand after 30 years on that coal face is that we are co-creating that moment together. So I'm bringing what I've got, the skills and experience and familiarity with that situation. They're bringing their emotional response and their beliefs or whatever. They're bringing all of who they are to that moment. The people who will live on and also the dying person if that person is still there and you're just sort of dancing with everybody so there are no standard things and sometimes people just want to talk that out and they will go on to create a ceremony or a way of being for themselves sometimes people want to open up a dialogue that they sort of can't do unless you've got a third person there to ask those questions and What's happened for me now, which I think is like anybody who does something for a long time and is open to learning from that experience as well as bringing the best of who they are to it, everyone's a teacher. So they're looking at me, but I'm also looking at them. To, so when people are distressed and crying and feeling a pain or not wanting to die, I just love them in their humanness because they're not paralyzed by fear. They're not numb. They are actually trying their best to understand a situation that is causing them pain, physical, emotional separation. They won't be, the, you know, a lot of young parents die. And so they they do not want to leave their children behind, their young children to live a life without them. So it's about exploring what it is that is their concern or what can be done to put something into place or for them to absolutely use that limited time that they have left to the best of it so for example you know a lot of adults don't want to tell the children that they're dying because they want those kids to not carry that burden but that is a disservice to the children and you can speak to adults who years ago their parents took that approach and they are living with the pain of that moment. And so kids now won't go to school for that last month. They can go to school anytime. They, but that parent only has a limited amount of time to fill that child with enough memories and enough love to last them their whole life because they're going to live their whole life without that person in it. So if they can fill them up rather than sort of try and protect them, that is the best use of that month of dying if they are concerned about the children. And they will do that, but then there will come a time where then even that they feel they've done that the best they can and then they're going in and they're closing down in order to go out. Their body's closing down, but their emotional connection to people also closes down. And then they're just in their own journey of whatever that might be to, if they believe that something leaves the body, then they will be leaving that body behind and they're in their own um, moment of, of whatever it is they want to think about. So it's very different. You, and 
I, I'm a sort of, when I came to this work, I was a very black and white person. It was very like, there's this and there's this. But I've learned to become very grey and to be able to sit in a kindness with a presence and a neutrality and a kindness to those people, whatever their set of circumstances is. And I can't make it better. I can only contribute what I have, but that moment belongs to their family and that, that relationship. And I'm just walking with them, offering what I can, but ultimately it's theirs. And it can be good or bad, terrible or beautiful, or all of those things all at the same time. Zenith, I read an article on death some years back, written by a doctor. It was a secular article. It wasn't propounding any sort of spiritual belief. But one of the things that it said was that people that are passing away, especially older people, become quite interested in their own past and especially their own childhood. And it also said that some of these people start to see and and it didn't make a judgment call it didn't say whether this was a hallucination or authentic or anything but it said a lot of them start to see dead relatives from their own past appearing and having conversations with them and things yeah. like that has that been your experience too yeah totally and it's a very common experience worldwide regardless of what you believe and it's been very well documented especially of late of what also happens to the brain or our nervous systems when people are having that experience that those people who have died previously are there in some sort of spirit form at the end of their bed or in that room and there's a wonderful guy Michael Barbato who's a doctor in Australia who's was a palliative care doctor he's older than me now so he must be in his 70s very beautiful man and he's been doing that research um, with people who are dying wired up because he's a doctor they let him into the hospital to do that project with all the required uh, controls on it and he found some really interesting things but very much that it's very real for those people and but I could tell you a story a woman here in her 70s who wasn't dying was frail and elderly and her body was deteriorating but it was she didn't have a disease and she did not want to deteriorate past a certain point so I spoke with her son and her and she decided that she would stop eating and drinking and she would st live in the care of her f son and his family they had two daughters and they made signs that was like a piece of chocolate cake with a big red cross through it, a glass of water with a big red cross through it and they were pinned up in her little house. And she stopped eating and drinking. They had a really beautiful conversation all together. And after about five days, I went to see her to say goodbye. And so I'm sitting there behind me, uh, her son and his wife, who I'd married at some stage as a celebrant. And the woman was sitting in front of me. She was a very ordinary, lovely, you know, older woman. And I said, you know, can I just ask you one question? You know, what do you think will happen when you die? And her face was just absolutely radiant. And she said, oh, I'll see my parents. And she just filled the room with this absolute radiant joy. And they were sitting behind me and I could hear them catch their breath and start to cry. And the son said, uh, and anyone else? Because he was fishing for his father who had died. They'd been happily married and he'd died some years before. And she said, oh, and my brother. And she just was in a rapture at the thought that she would be reunited with her dead family. And they, that must have been ages ago that they died. And then the son said, and what about dad? And she said, oh, and dad. And she, she, it was just so incredible. And we carried on talking. I wished her well with that journey. I said, I probably won't see you alive again. So I'm just hoping that it's a beautiful journey for you that is gentle and 
about another five days passed, so ten days altogether. The son rang and said, oh, Zen, I'm just ringing to tell you mum died. And I said, oh, how was it? And he said, you know what? She died in my arms and all I could think of was how excited she was about reuniting with her family. And he said, I couldn't be anything but joyful for her and wishing that that is going to happen. So it's those sorts of beliefs, but that sort of experience that bring us comfort and allow us to live on a human being so incredibly resilient, so incredibly capable and courageous. They're the three, you know, the three words that come back to me over and over again with uh, sitting with people. If they are given honesty and information and uh, and opportunities to participate from a clear perspective, people will rise to that and be the very best they can be. And it's incredibly humbling to watch people, you know, walking or moving towards their own death, taking their families with them in the best possible way that they can. And so it's a practice, but we need to be open to that possibility every day. To you could you could die today. I mean, they're all sort of cliches, but they're all absolute truths. And and so. Often I'm encouraging parents for one cup of tea a day to sit with the possibility that their children will die. And it's usually the people will say, oh, I'm okay with death, I think. You know, I'm good. I've had a good life. But then you ask the question, are you okay with your children dying or your nieces and nephews if you don't have children? And people will say, oh, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that. So that's a practice to expand that capacity to be able to be in that experience and experience it as fully as possible, not to go into a shock, not to be traumatized by those sorts of experiences. And if it never happens, great. But if it happens to someone else or to you, you will have a muscle that you've already you know, worked with and you can rely on in that moment and it will just allow you to experience that in a fuller way rather than in a closed off way but of course it's everyone's worst nightmare brian forgive me for asking all the questions here and and dominating this but i told you i'm a little bit afraid with this one because it's something that really does confront me and it's interesting hearing you say this zenith because that's one of my greatest fears is losing my son or my daughter and it's interesting because one of the things I've learned from therapy over the years is lean into your fears rather than running from them. And hearing you saying, have a cup yeah. of tea with this, you know, in a Buddhist perspective, with this Maya that comes along with this, with this threat, invite it in and have a cup of tea. That's what the Buddha says, right? Which is interesting that you say that. And maybe that was intentional, but still I'm going to take it as, as deep. And I'm thinking that's how I could make peace with this. I could invite this in have a cup of tea with it and yeah make peace with this because it may never happen but it may that's right but it it's about growing a capacity so because you the you know you might be sitting watching your kids playing or doing something or just in their company and you're sitting there thinking how would it be if my kids die and most people close that thought down pretty fast I can't entertain that that's just too much for me but gradually you can extend that capacity and I had to do it when I started working with death I had to do it with my kids and I was pretty good with that my kids all became adults and then my youngest son had a daughter and as I, I thought oh now I'm going to have to do that practice all over again with grandchildren because now they're vulnerable, small, beautiful babies, and that sense of attachment to them to, to, to contribute to their lives or not to want them to hurt reappeared. And so I, had, I did it. It was very quick for me because I've obviously got a lot of familiarity and understanding about attachment and non-attachment. But I think it's a really great practice for everyone. I mean, you can practice it with your parents, 
with your siblings, with your partner, they're more easier to practice and then come to the children. But these, you know, we know it's a possibility. We know it's a reality. And even if you, it doesn't happen to your children, you'll be able to support your friends and family if it happens to them. You'll be the only one that won't be smothering them with pity or shock or distress. You'll be able to walk in and they can lean into you because you're not you know, all over them with pity or distress or needing them to make you feel better because you can't imagine how they feel, which I see a lot. And that is a very painful thing to watch um, other families going to the bereaved parents and sucking that energy out of them because they haven't done any practice and it's their it's that and you will see that now I mean you might have seen it already but we see it often at a ceremony where everyone comes and smothers them that couple with their you know with their despair and their need to feel better and often you'll see the you know the bereaved mother or father patting someone else on the back because they're sobbing on their shoulder and that's an unnecessary uh, distress for families to have to have on top of their own distress is other people's. Zenith, to to combat that, you're you've been quoted as saying death is our birthright, and you talk about the emphasis on and the importance of that pre need information. So people thinking earlier about it, yeah. how you deliver training and education, not only for individuals and families, but for communities to help them think about death and dying well. Can you talk to us about how communities, individuals and families can do that and what are some of the tools that they can use? Well, I think having a practice where you invite something in or you lean into it, just exactly what we've just covered, is a great start for per people on an individual level. And often people will say, oh, they've got a great faith that will support them. But my experience from a neutral place is that faith can be a help or a hindrance. So some people will invest in it and it will support them through whatever comes. But others, people may have done something in their past where they feel they will be judged by their God when they die, that they've kept a secret for their whole life, even if they've tried to live a good life because of that. So you cannot assume anything that things are what they seem. The only thing you can do is be in dialogue with that person and try to encourage them to um, express what their concerns are around their dying or whether they're or whether they're well and they do that. So it's a very different experience for everybody. But the more information you have, the more you understand what your options are, the more you can consider those and make the decisions that are right for you. So whether you want a church funeral or a funeral in a park, whether you want your body to be kept at home and washed and dressed by your family, whether you want to go into hospital so that your family can be supported by a 24-hour medical system and they can just be the, you know, the grieving or bereaved partner, children, parents, whatever. So it's about understanding what is really going on for people and so I transform the word fear into concern and language is a is really my only one of my only tools apart from what I bring on the inside but that it's the it's the bridge between what I have to offer and that person so I'm trying to use my language as skillfully and as kindly as I can. So when someone says, oh, I'm afraid of dying, my response is usually, can you tell me what, what part of dying you're concerned about? Is it leaving your kids behind? Is it that you won't be there to support your partner? Is it that you're attached to that beautiful house or those possessions, or you don't feel you've really lived? And a lot of people are concerned about dying because they haven't lived the life they wanted to or they're distressed about 
um, their faith. They feel that God's not been kind to them. Why me? So there's a whole thrash that people can have. And you can't, you can't just go in there addressing it if you don't know what it is. Because sometimes it's something really quirky for people. And if, if, you're, if you can come neutral to that experience and not patronizing or not matronizing, because you're not, we're not dying. We can accompany people, we can sit with them, we can be with them, but we're not dying. What they're doing is giving us an opportunity to see how we want to die. So dying well, so it's a grandparent's role to teach grandchildren what it means to die. And they're, if they're elderly and they've lived a full life, they will be kind to those children because they love them. Because what they're doing is once they die, everyone's going to move up off that diving board. So they're going to dive off into their death and then their parents are going to move along, but everybody's moving along. And so it's we just need to really expand into love rather than contract into fear. And it, it's sort of as simple as that. And that's what I see. Some people are expanding into love for themselves, for life, for death, and for their families or friends. And others are contracting into fear and they don't want to discuss it. They don't want to look at it. And that must be a terrifying place to be. And so I just... Sometimes I just say, well, I'm just going to leave you there because sometimes it is just shit and people you can't get any further with those people and I just have to wish them well. But there are some, you know, absolutes that about comfort and care and respect and offering people something that makes that experience the best it can be in order to live on without that person physically in our lives. They're always in our memories. But some people are glad that person is dying because their suffering will be over or because they've been a tyrant to that person and they will be glad that they will be free of them in that death. And all of that can be sitting at the kitchen table in one family. So I've learned such a lot about coming open to each experience and but the what's important is that you come and you're not wishy-washy you're not fake or false with your patronizing sort of shit that you come as an authentic someone who doesn't know anything but you're willing to be there and you're working for the best for that person each of those people and sometimes they all need different things out of that experience and the more people do that in advance rather than on the deathbed the more quality of life they have and quality of death i'm not sure if that's the answer to that question but anyway oh, it was it was wonderful thank you zenith i'm listening to you talk about fear concern but you also talked about love and I want to drill down on that with you. What's the role of love in, in this process? And what's its magic? What does it do? It makes anything possible. I think I say this a lot in different circumstances, but love is the strongest force on the planet. And people are incredibly capable and courageous. And the word courage comes from... Uh, core, which is the French word for heart. And so we associate love with the heart in some sort of graphic way, the red you know, shape that we're all aligned to. And so for me, when I see people acting courageously, I see that as a love-based action and that love will allow us to, to be bigger than we ever thought was possible. And I watch people move within, sometimes within a couple of hours from being in one position to another. So that might be, I don't want to be caring for that person. I don't want to be dealing with that dead body. 
I don't want to go and see that person who's just been pulled out of the ocean or hung themselves or that body that's been in a car accident. And people with with openness and honesty and a, and a guidance will rise to that occasion and that that action, those actions for people, even to get up and speak to someone who's dying or to get up and speak at the funeral, most of those actions are propelled or fueled by love, either a love for themselves or a love for the other person or a love for someone else involved. So love is is the strongest fuel it's the greatest motivator and it's sort of omnipresent and you know we're not talking about romantic love so what I've learned to do is when I see people on their knees destroyed by that death in that moment I love them in their suffering I love it that they are feeling human beings and that they know what love is because that love has, is transformed into all those different emotions that they're feeling. And eventually it will transform itself back into love. That may be a journey that takes a few months. It may be a journey that takes a few years. It may be a journey that takes a lifetime. And often you know, if you've had some uh, dispute with somebody and a separation from them, often that death will allow you to see that from a different perspective. And it was, it's a great teacher. Death is an opportunity to, to do so many things in your own life that because it makes you appreciate time, perspective, but love is the great motivator. And I see it in many different forms and I see it in myself. I've seen how that's grown and my capacity to be with everyone and love them in their suffering, love them for who they are. And, uh, you know, things I never thought would be possible that I would learn. But those situations have taught me a whole lot about love and I I'm a better person for that and everybody is better by by expanding and being able to be with with bigger situations or more challenging situations that are in our path and you can either try and run away from it be reduced by it be fearful of it smash it to one side or you can open to it and feel it fully because you can't so for example the whole concepts around grief which I don't say very often I usually use the term bereavement but you can't do grief you can't do it to some sort of stages or process it has to do you it has to do you with what you bring to that so far in your life, what your conditioning is, what your beliefs are, what your emotional capacity is. It will do you and it will free you at the end of it. But the, the more you work with love, the more painful it might be, but the quicker that process will be because it takes a lot of energy to resist something. And resisting our inherent nature is is a pretty big waste of time and energy I would say and so I see people expand and grow beyond what they thought was possible because we all know the concept of post-traumatic distress or um, disorder but there's also post-traumatic growth and we see that every day. We see it in big ways. And the, the most obvious examples are where in parents when their children die and they create a movement or an organization because they don't want other children to die in that way, whatever it might be. And so instead of being diminished by that experience, they grow and expand almost exponentially into people that they never, they're public speakers, they're out there in the public eye, 
campaigning against you know laws that restrict drugs so that their children are fearful and they die because the the kids don't have the proper education about those drugs and they will become warriors for that cause they are growing from that death in a way that you wouldn't expect because we expect people to be diminished for a while but some people don't and and i think the story about the woman who stopped eating and drinking her son you know his love for her grew a capacity in him to accompany, to allow that to happen to accompany her in the, her dying but also when she died he he expanded in a way that was so beautiful to see and he really loved her he you know he wanted her to be there for his grandchildren but he was man enough and a person enough to honor her wishes and accompany her in that journey with a deep love and respect and he made a statement he said i always knew my mum was a beautiful person but i never knew how courageous she was until she took that journey and i think that's a beautiful thing for a child to be able to say about their parent or anyone absolutely Senator, have you, you know, you've been doing this work for 30 years. So you you are somewhat of an expert in this space. And I'm just wondering what, have you seen the attitudes towards death and dying evolve over that 30 years? And what do you think have facilitated those shifts, the good, the bad, the ugly? Yes, I've seen lots of change. And I'd say it's all been a great thing. And I think one of the biggest changes is people who have walked away from a religion they were born into and that conditioning and that set of dogma that set of beliefs that people hold when people start to live a life that is not overseen by someone else's set of rules then and people who become much more connected to nature i think you know we a lot of people are activists for the climate for the planet but a lot of people are resourcing themselves into the natural beauty of our world and becoming much more akin to that, whereas, of course, some religions are, what is it, you have to have dominion over nature or something like that. So I think people are just really coming back into their own humanity. And we're fortunate enough in Australia to live in a country where there is a freedom to do or be whoever you want whatever choices you might make in that and in that I see you know a lot of people who are coming back into a simpler lifestyle that doesn't involve a dogma so when and and some people then cling go back into that uh, belief structure because they need something to support them in that so there's a freedom, you know, what is it to live a human life? I, my opinion is now it's to become the best people we can be and to be a benefit to others, to offer our skills, our wisdom as an elder to others if they want to listen to it or even if they don't want to listen to it and and just and pass that on as we pass through a life and it's a very fortunate position to be able to, you know, even to offer what you're offering, where you're offering, you know, the benefit of your life experience in order to help others in their journey. So you're like a, you know, a light bulb for people to find in a dark place and know that there are other people who have walked that path before and your people are tapping in to your strength and experience and familiarity in order to grow that capacity in themselves. But death is an absolute. And so it's a no brainer. It's going to happen to us and it's going to happen to everybody else that we love. And it's just the order that we don't know. And so the more we become friends with death, that we allow it to be omnipresent, to walk with us every day, to say, oh, yeah, I could die today, but I'm, you know, how do I feel about that? And it, in order to teach us how to live well, and it's a lifetime's journey. And some people will die at a young age, 
but they will be wiser than a lot of people who live a long time. And you often see, one of the other things I've learned is that some people don't come to live a long time. When you're standing at a ceremony and you listen to everybody commenting about that person, especially if it's a child, you'll see that they often come, they burn really bright, really fast, they touch a lot of people, and then they're gone. And it's only our sense of attachment and our commentary like, oh, they've died too soon. You can't die too soon. You die when you die. It's only a concept that we overlay on something to make ourselves feel better or worse, actually. So my my role is to try and bring that into a sort of an equilibrium, an equanimity, where you can hold the pain of the loss and the death of that person and their future that they're not going to have in a way that allows you to live on and not be destroyed by that and actually bring that experience to to benefit others in some way, even if it's like, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time doing shit you don't want to do. Live, live your life fully. Become an artist. Become a musician. You know, take a risk. You know, move to the country. Whatever it is, you know, because everybody has done everything before. And we've all experienced death. We're all going to die. We know that. Not as an inevitability, but as our birthright. And if there was no death, physical death, we wouldn't treasure life so much. I mean, these are no-brainers. They're not me. They're universal concepts that people have come to over many years and centuries. I remember one of the the biggest learnings for me, Zenith, in, in this space was I read a book. Um, I think it was called Seven Dying Australians. You, you may have heard of it or read the book, but it was it's a fascinating book, and it's the account of seven Australians range from I think the youngest was seventeen right through to someone who was in their eighties, and the book's over twenty years old. But it's a candid account from each of those people about their fears, their hopes, um, their life and what it's been and what they see their death may accomplish. And it's a beautiful book. Like it's one that I, I really embraced when I was reading it because as difficult as it was to read it, it was freeing as well because I was hearing from people who were living the experience that we are all going to face one day. So I do encourage very much on the back of what you were saying, people to embrace it to face their fears, to dive headfirst into it, and you'll probably be surprised. Like it's not as scary as, as people think. And as as final as death is, talking to people about their experiences of it can be really freeing, I think. So it's it's definitely something I recommend. And I recommend to you, Zenith, if you haven't read it, Seven Dying Australians, a great book. Yeah, I, I probably won't. Thank you for that. But, you know, death's my reality. I don't need to read, I don't need to watch it for entertainment or read, you know, I'm, I'm into other things about life. You know, I get enough death experience by, on the cold face. I don't, I'm not a researcher. I'm just busy having a great life, you know. I am not offended by you not taking up my recommendation. <laughs> to all our other listeners, though, I recommend yes. it for those who want to. Who want to <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think the more familiar people become, the more capacity they grow to deal with any experience. So th- I think it's great to read those books. I, I'm just not that person. I, I'm like an extreme sports person. I'm like a downhill skier. I'm like, okay, give me that experience so I can really feel it, not think it through a book. And fortunately, life does that to me. Zenith, I have really enjoyed this chat. I told you in the pre-record that I was a little bit nervous about this because I didn't know what boxes and what buttons were going to be pushed within me. But thank you very much. It's been an absolutely wonderful conversation i think for a lot of our audience who are afraid of fear excuse me for a lot of our audience who are afraid of death opening the box looking inside and as we said before inviting it in and having a cup of tea with it 
is actually a really good thing. So I, I want to thank you on a personal level, but also on behalf of our listeners. This has been a wonderful chat. Yeah, and I, I thank you for giving me that opportunity. No, no, no problem. And we will put lots of links in our show notes to your work and to your website where people can learn more about you and um, maybe even get in touch if, if they need to. So again, thank you for taking the time. I know you are an incredibly busy person. So thank you for taking the time out. On a Saturday morning, you can now go and enjoy the beautiful Byron sun. It's actually overcast. I'm going off to see an 80-year-old woman who wants to marry her partner so that when she dies, her legal aspects will be simple. So um, I'm going off to see her after this. So that's one extreme. Well, it's both. It's love and death all, all in one meeting. I love it. What a beautiful way to, to end. Thank you again, Zena. Yeah. Have a fantastic weekend. You're welcome. Thank you. If you'd like to connect with the I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist podcast, then please see the links in our link tree in the show notes. We invite you to join our listener community on Facebook, and we're also on Instagram, X, and Reddit. Check out our merch on Redbubble. We've got T-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and all kinds of great evangelical stuff that you can wear proudly. All proceeds go to building and promoting the podcast. We want to give a huge shout out to our Patreon supporters. Subscribers get a range of benefits, including free merch, early access to episodes, access to our exclusive subscribers group, and monthly bonus content. Again, all proceeds of this go to the running and promotion costs of the podcast. A special thanks to Arva, who manages our social strategy, and also to Kerry and Bree, who manage our Facebook listener group, and also to Bree, who puts out our monthly newsletter on Substack. All of our episodes are transcribed by Leanne to increase accessibility. The show is produced and hosted by Brian McDowell and Troy Waller. The sound engineering for this episode was done by Beck Wise. I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist is available wherever you find your podcasts. Again, you can find all our links in our link tree in the show notes. Or why don't you pop across to our website at www.iwasateenagefundamentalist.com 